when a knock startled him from his slumber bakugo's first response was utter fury who the hell was pounding on his door at he squinted blearily at his alarm clock one o'clock in the goddamn morning fumbling for his nightstand lamp he nearly knocked it over before finding the light switch it was like a fucking spotlight searing his retinas and filling his vision with purple spots he cursed rolling himself out of the bed and staggering to the door this better be fucking good he snarled yanking the door open furiously blinking up at him was sundress girl arakaki in pajamas a strained look on her face i'm sorry for waking you she said then added i need your help Bakugo scowled. If it had been literally anyone else, he could have turned them away. But damn it, he owed this girl for showing him around, and she was a tough cookie besides that. If something had her upset, it must be serious. Come in, Bakugo said as he pulled the door open, stomping back across the room and sitting cross-legged on his bed. Arakaki entered hesitantly shutting the door behind herself and hovering awkwardly near the door for several seconds before finally crossing the room and taking a seat beside him, since the room was not furnished with any other places to sit. Sorry to wake you, she apologized. I was out late. She blushed a little at this admission and Kotsky fought to keep his eye rolls to a minimum. I didn't realize until I got back, but my suppressants are gone. Bakugo inhaled sharply. But you're not even a mandatory resident. Why the fuck would they search your room? The young woman shrugged, her face downcast. I don't know, she confessed. I started them before coming here because it's easy to have your heat triggered early by another Omega. To avoid that, I went on suppressants. If I go off them, I'll go into heat within the next 24 hours. She glanced up at Kotsky in supplication. I haven't had my evening dose so I'll probably be in heat by morning, unless... Fuck. Kotsky closed his eyes briefly, cursing his luck. He stood then, moving over to his wardrobe and withdrawing one of his two-day packets he'd stowed in his pants pocket. He moved back to the bed and handed it to Arakaki. I take Anifrin, 20 milligram tablets. He told her. That's not going to be a problem. I take the generic version of that, but only 10 mil. She answered, straightening up a little, eyeing the packet. I'll break them in half. Great, so that meant she'd have a four-day supply, and Kotsky still had exactly seven days left of his own dosage. He frowned, turning to Arakaki. Do you know anyone who could bring you a refill? I can't comfortably give you more than what you have there, but it should last you until you get a new bottle. Arakaki winced a little. Actually, I don't know anyone. I'm new in town moved here with my fiancé a little over a month ago for his job. Kotsky raised an eyebrow. So why the fuck are you here? In a heat house, he didn't add, because he felt it was implied. It turned out he was moving closer to more than just his job. Sundress girl spat, tangling her fingers in the hem of her pajama shirt. When I found out he'd been cheating for almost a year now, it wasn't pretty. Anyway, we broke up last week. He said he couldn't stand the idea of spending even one more heat with me, so... She put on a brave face, but it obviously still hurt her to talk about the breakup. I signed up for a month here, and since I haven't even found a job in town yet, it wasn't hard to make the time. I just moved all my stuff from our apartment to here. She chuckled bitterly. Most of it wasn't even unpacked yet. She bit her lip. Frankly, I don't even know where I'm staying after this month. I'll probably just go back to my parents' house, at least for now. Kotsky stared at her for a long moment. He wanted to complain about not wanting her life story, but he technically asked, so that was on him. Instead, he just scowled at how her situation complicated things. So you don't know anyone around here, at all? He knew he was repeating himself, but damn. The woman shook her head dejectedly before shooting a sneer in his direction. The only person I know besides my ex is you, she said. And Yamanaka, she added a moment later, trying to aim her tone of voice for casual and not really succeeding. Right. Kotsky pulled out his phone, 
ignoring the fact that this girl was obviously insane to list him as someone she knew. Do you at least know a place where you can get some more pills? She nodded. I got my first bottle over the counter from the pharmacy just down the street. I didn't need the suppressants until coming to the gentle embrace, so... Kotsky nodded, pulling up a map application and searching for nearby pharmacies. Is it Tomud's? He asked her, noting the nearest drugstore on the map. She nodded. Yes. Do you need the 10-day bottle or the 30-day one? He asked, closing the app and setting his phone back down. I'm not sure. A rocket he admitted, frowning and counting on her fingers, muttering to herself. Maybe 20 days? Will that be enough to finish out my month? I need to check my calendar. A frown crossed her delicate features as another thought seemed to take hold. I'm sorry, how are you going to get the pills? She was giving him a strange look. If either of us leaves this place without an alpha, it's breach of contract, so... A friend of mine is coming the day after. Well, technically it's tomorrow now. He glowered at the clock, which read 118, before turning to face her completely. I can have him pick them up on his way in. Arakaki frowned at him. Why are you having a friend come here? They don't let betas... He's an alpha. It's fine. You can trust him. Bakugo cut her off. Arakaki's eyebrows jumped up to her forehead in surprise. High praise from a guy who seems to hate every alpha in the place. She smirked a little, leaning in towards Bakugo. Is he special to you? Fuck off. Koski snapped, but it lacked venom. He's coming to tell that fucking asshole who was getting too handsy to fuck off so I don't get in trouble and end up here again next rut season. Arakaki frowned, nodding thoughtfully. That's... not every alpha would do that for a friend. She noted, leaning even more into his personal space, having the audacity to fucking wiggle her eyebrows at him. You're sure there's not... He doesn't even fucking know that I'm the one who's being harassed. Kotsky snapped, feeling defensive for some reason. He's just a good guy, that's all. Arakaki blinked in confusion. He doesn't know. Why else would he come then? Because I told him an Omega was being harassed and he offered to help. Kotsky growled, noting with irritation that what should have been a simple conversation had somehow turned into a sleepover gossip. Where the hell did you find this guy? Arakaki demanded, her eyes shining as she leaned back, obviously impressed. He sounds awesome. Despite himself, Kotsky stiffened defensively. You can't fucking have him. He thought, then fought back the emotion. It was a pointless reaction anyway, since Kirishima wasn't even interested in Omegas. He is a great guy. He agreed. But he's off limits. Again, Arakaki quirked an eyebrow in his direction. Because you've set your sights on him? She asked, her voice taking on a teasing tone. Kotsky casually flipped her the bird, grimacing pointedly in her direction. Fuck no. He could feel his traitorous face heating despite his words. With a sigh, he dropped his hand, balling it into a fist. Even if I had, it wouldn't fucking matter anyway. He's taken. Arakaki asked cautiously, her voice soft, sympathetic. God, he hated to be pitied. He scowled at her. Don't, he said warningly. There's a reason I'm a mandatory resident, remember? I don't fucking want an alpha. Arakaki stared back at him with a serious look, her eyes seeming to see much deeper than the surface of that which was sitting before her. Don't want any alpha, or you only want the one you can't have. Fuck. She was too perceptive, and it was too late to be having a conversation with some fucking stranger about something he'd never talked about with anyone else before. There's nothing I can do about it, so who fucking cares? He growled. You can't just give up. Arakaki insisted, leaning forward, adding conspiratorially. I mean, if I think you're vaguely likable, then there's gotta be some hope. I thought you were a total asshole when we first met. She told him, her smirk morphing into an encouraging smile. I'm sure if you said something, he might- He's into alphas. Kotsky interrupted her. Not omegas. She blinked, leaning back. Oh. She said, her voice so soft he almost didn't hear her. 
She pinched her lips together, giving him another look of sympathy. But you said he didn't know you were the Omega in trouble, but he's still coming to help. She said carefully. So he doesn't hate Omegas? Yeah, he's a good guy. Kotsky growled. Better than me, for sure. He scowled at Arakaki. And I already told you, stop with the sad looks. I've already accepted that he's not into Omegas. She frowned. Then why didn't you tell him you were the one being harassed? Kotsky closed his eyes momentarily. Fuck this shit. He doesn't know that I'm an Omega. Arakaki leaned back a little. How? She asked. I mean, sure you're on suppressants now, but... I'm always on suppressants, Kotsky replied. And scent neutralizers, as is everyone else I work with. Arakaki frowned at that information. What kind of job do you have that would require total suppression? She demanded. That's only for intense jobs, like police or emergency responders or... Her eyes trailed along his body, noting his black tank top, black shorts, and her eyes snapped back up to his face. Kotsky could see the wheels turning as she envisioned him in the mask. She scooted backwards suddenly, her eyes wide. No way, she exclaimed. Is that why you asked about our favorite pro heroes? I thought you were just a power junkie obsessed with high quirk levels. I never expected... She pointed a finger at him suddenly, her voice rising. Ground Zero? Kotsky sneered, lifting his hands in a gesture of surrender. Guilty as charged. She blinked hard. So when you say you have a trustworthy alpha friend who can bring me my replacement suppressants, he's a pro hero too, isn't he? Kotsky nodded. Yeah. A pro hero alpha who's into other alphas. Damn. No wonder he's off limits. Arakaki noted. He can't even experiment. They'd crucify his public image. Kotsky nodded. And I can't tell him, or he'd try to fucking settle for me. I won't let him do that. Arakaki nodded. Considering you're smitten with him, that would be hard on you. She agreed. Kotsky was on his feet in an instant. The fuck is that supposed to mean? He snarled. Arakaki just fixed a look on him. Really? It's obvious from the way you talk about him. Kotsky wanted to deny that, but, well, he'd basically extolled Kirishima's virtues to her in excess. He couldn't exactly deny that he was interested, and besides, it didn't fucking matter anyway, because it could never happen. Fine. Yes. I would mate him if I could be sure it wouldn't disgust him to do so. Kotsky scowled, sitting back down on his bed. Arakaki nodded slowly. Sure. She agreed. She looked about to say something else, and Kotsky just fixed a glare on her until she cleared her throat awkwardly. Well, she said weakly, if you trust him, then I guess I can trust him too. I'll figure out exactly how many dosage days I need tonight, and give you the information tomorrow so he can pick up the suppressants for me. She smiled sheepishly. Kotsky nodded. Works for me. Arakaki relaxed visibly. Good, she said. I was worried. I'm not ready to go into heat yet. She smiled at Kotsky. For all this, oh, he's such a great guy shit you went on about, you're really not so terrible yourself. Kotsky rolled his eyes. You're just saying that to try and ingratiate yourself with me. Smirking, Arakaki stood and stretched her arms, yawning. Is it working? She asked, a cheeky grin peeking through. Not really. Kotsky replied, but he smirked back. Now let me get three hours of sleep before my alarm goes off. Arakaki frowned. You're getting up at four? Bakugo pointed at the clock, which read 131, and raised an eyebrow as if to say, I'm not the one staying up at all hours. But, she frowned. That's so early. Gotta fit a workout in somewhere. She blinked, considering this. Fair. She decided. Well, I won't take up any more of your precious sleep time, then. Kotsky nodded, moving to the door and opening it. Get the information to me as soon as you can, and I'll make sure your suppressants get here without too much of a hassle. She smiled. 
Thank you, Bakugo. Forget it, Kotsky replied. Actually, forget this entire conversation even happened. She laughed at that. Whatever you say. Thanks for the help. Yeah, well, I owed you, Kotsky replied. We're even now. Arakaki grinned at that. If you say so, sleep well. She said, then closed the door behind herself. With a sigh, Kotsky flopped back down on his bed and flicked off the lamp. Unfortunately, sleep was a fickle creature, and it eluded him for another hour at least before he could finally chase the restless thoughts from his head and sink into a fitful slumber. When 4.30 came, Bakugo rose to meet it like an enraged bull. He didn't enjoy sleep deprivation, and it was all he could do to keep himself from incinerating his alarm clock. Still, it had been his own choice to wake up at an ungodly hour in the morning, and he was going to make the most of it. He started with some stretching, trying to loosen up a bit, then shifted to some body weight strength training exercises. He had been working out for about an hour, and was in the middle of a set of handstand push-ups when a light knock sounded at his door. Doors open. He grunted, and it swung wide to reveal a rock key. A small piece of paper clutched in her hand. I figured out how many days I need, she said. I wrote it down for you to pass it on. She blinked hard, staring at Kotsky like she'd never seen a guy doing handstand push-ups before. Oh my god, I keep forgetting you're a real-life superhero, she said weakly. Are you even human? Kotsky sighed, finishing his set before standing up to face her. What are you doing up so early? He demanded, ignoring her obvious lack of experience in the gym. She had no idea what the human body was capable of, so obviously she would see his feet as impressive when it was really a basic weight and balance exercise. He had to have strong bracing muscles in his arms to handle his quirks recoil. He may have been given support items to help with that shit, but internal support didn't hurt either. Arakaki had the decency to look embarrassed at being called out for being up so early after her objection mere hours previous at the news that he would be getting up at an ungodly hour. I couldn't sleep, she confessed. I know I took the meds and all, but I was still, I don't know, paranoid. Every time I felt a little too warm under my blankets, my brain would be screaming, you're in heat, and then I... Well, anyway, it was hard to get comfortable. She shrugged weakly so I made sure to calculate exactly how many days I'd need, four or five times. She ducked her head sheepishly, but couldn't hide the strain in her voice. Bakugo didn't blame her. The idea of going into heat in a heat house when there weren't any alphas there who you were sure you actually wanted was terrifying. That desperate fear of losing control was not lost on him. Bakugo nodded. If you have it decided, I'll take it now. He extended a hand, and Arakaki gave him the note she'd scribbled with the details, the generic drug name, dosage amount, and the number of doses. I'll be sure to get it to my friend so he knows what to pick up. Arakaki smiled. Thanks. Now that I've handed it off, I feel like I can finally relax a little. She grinned. I think I'll go to bed now. Bakugo rolled his eyes. You do that. Good luck with the rest of your workout, I guess. Arakaki added with a small smile. Her eyes glinted a little. Are you actually going to show off that Adonis-like physique today, or will you be attempting to hide it under yet another baggy jacket? Kotsky leveled an unimpressed stare at her. What part of mandatory resident isn't getting through to you? Arakaki shrugged and then leered at him. Just because you don't want to be here doesn't mean you can't enjoy getting a little attention. Kotsky blinked a few times. In case you've forgotten, attention is precisely the reason why I have a friend coming. Her face blanched, and she bit her lip. Right, I forgot. Sorry. She apologized, her shoulders slumping a little. I think I'll be eating breakfast at 7.30 in the cafeteria, if you want to join me. She said after a moment, glancing up to look him in the eye, a small smirk tugging at the corner of her lips. You do know where that is. Kotsky considered this. I don't. He frowned suddenly, another question coming to mind as he considered another detail. Also, how the fuck did you even figure out where my room is? Arakaki shrugged. I just asked the staff which room belonged to the mandatory resident. They didn't see any reason to keep that sort of information private. She scowled a little. They usually don't. She indicated the lock on the door handle with a jerk of her head. 
It's a good idea to keep it locked if you're ever in here alone during visiting hours. She made a small face. Especially if you're still dealing with creepy alphas. Kotsky nodded his appreciation for the word of advice. So where's the cafeteria? I can come get you at 7.20, Arakaki offered, and we can go together. After considering this for a moment, Kotsky nodded. Fine, now get out so I can finish my workout. Arakaki just laughed. Okay, fine, I'll see you at 7.20. Bakugo ignored her in favor of starting a set of tricep dips on the side of his bed. Yeah, yeah, whatever, fuck off. Arakaki snorted in amusement and shut the door behind herself. As soon as she'd walked off, Bakugo immediately stood and locked the door. Fuck. He scolded himself for not realizing last night that she shouldn't have known where his room was, and how the hell had she found him. Of course, the fucking staff didn't even respect basic privacy rules. Fuck. Now he had to be extra careful to make a habit of locking up behind himself. Even though it technically wasn't visitation hours yet, some alphas had night privileges, and he couldn't guarantee that Adashi hadn't somehow wormed his way into getting that as well. And now that he knew that anyone could just fucking ask the staff where his room was located, he wondered if maybe Adachi really had been the one to take the hidden suppressant stashes from his room. Damn it. The day had barely started and he was already furious. No privacy, no access to suppressants, no gym. Why the hell would anyone pay to live in a shithole like this for any length of time? Unless, he supposed, they were someone like Arakaki who had no mate, no home, and didn't know anyone. If he were in a similar situation, well, he still wouldn't go to a fucking heat house, but he could at least understand that it was a viable option for someone in a difficult situation. Still, why did this place have to be so awful? It was almost unbelievable that a place this terrible could stay in business. Maybe that was why they had to accept mandatory residents. The government payouts probably helped cover the bill since they probably didn't get many repeat omegas. Then again, the whole point of a heat house was to not have any repeat residents since they were supposed to find mates. Though maybe if they didn't enjoy the first mate they found, they might come back for another heat in a few months' time. Fuck. Now he'd lost count of how many reps he'd done. With a growl, Kotsky stood and stretched out his arms. They burned a little, but not much, since he was only using his body weight for the exercises. He did a few more body weight exercises that he could manage in his tiny room, and then sighed. It was more than likely that he'd get told that the hallways were not a jogging trail and that he could go for a jog when he was no longer held in mandatory residence, but he wasn't going to give up without trying. Besides, there were several floors to the building and running up and down stairs made for some decent cardio. He made sure he had all of his packets of suppressants on his person, then headed out. <laughs>